Well, hello everyone and welcome to an exciting award session. My name is Missy Morrow and I'm the current ASB awards chair. Today we'll hear from our pre-doctoral achievement award recipient, Dr. Katie Knaus, and our early career achievement award winner, Dr. Aaron Manning. Man Manin, excuse me. After those talks, we will hear from the finalists from both the Journal of Biomechanics Award and the Clinical Biomechanics Award. We will have a few minutes after each speaker for questions, so please put your questions in the chat and I will moderate that. Also, after the session, there's a reminder that there will be a follow up discussion in the spatial chat room S1 Borelli, and a link to that will be placed in the chat, but also you can find that by going into the, the main spatial chat entry point. So, let us begin. It's my honor to welcome and congratulate Katie Knaus on receiving the Pre-Doctoral Achievement Award, which recognizes early achievements by promising scientists prior to the award of their PhD. Katie completed her PhD in biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia and will be pursuing her postdoctoral research in bioengineering at the University of California, San Diego. Please join me in welcoming Katie to speak to us today about do the anterior fascicles of the soleus influence posterior fascicle behavior? And other important questions explored with 3D muscle modeling. Take it away, Katie. Thank you, Missy. Uh, thanks. I'm very excited to share work for my PhD at UVA today. Let me, there we go. So most of my PhD work was rooted in problems related to aging, specifically clinical problems that arise from muscle dysfunction. And so what I want to talk about today is specifically um, as people age, they experience gait impairments that are associated with plantar flexor dysfunction, which means they're associated with the tricep surrey muscle group. And so while this group muscle group we know plays an important role in this, it's often difficult to understand what's happening functionally. And that's because this muscle group is really complicated. It has a complex morphology. It has these interactions with connective tissues. We think about the Achilles tendon a lot, but it also, um, they have significant aponeurosis structures, um, which are internal tendons that kind of run through this muscle group. And in the case of the soleus, which is the largest of these muscles, it has these aponeuroses that actually are internal to it and divide it excuse me, into different sections, um, creating different compartments of fascicles where there's a unipinnate posterior section that surrounds a deeper bipinnate anterior section. And so while we know a lot about the structure of this muscle, it still makes it difficult for us to understand its function. And so throughout my PhD, I kind of always come back to this quote from Tom McMahon um, about muscle. And I think one, it highlights that we can have a lot of information and not all of it's helpful, but I really love this part about muscles illuminated in wonderful ways by mathematical arguments about how it works. And the work in my PhD is really focused on developing these mathematical arguments. And so as biomechanists, we've learned to represent muscle through math at many different scales. It has this beautiful hierarchical structure and so we can represent the sarcomere, which are the proteins within muscle, um, representing the force and length relationship as the sarcomeres are active and contracting, as well as passive behavior within these elements. But we can also have scaled this up so that we can represent a whole muscle tendon unit and look at muscles and model coordination across the body. But in doing this, we assume an idealized architecture of muscle. So we lump together the aponeurosis and free tendon in a passive structure. And we assume that muscle fascicles have uniform um, architectural properties. But what is, I think is really interesting and beautiful about muscle is that it comes in all sorts of shapes and arrangements. And so really to mathematically describe muscle, we need more models that span this gap. And this is especially important if we're going to answer questions about really complex muscles like the soleus. But really, um, we are able to do this 
through in my PhD work, I use finite element modeling um, because it actually allows us to address these different scales. So we can address this middle scale by actually creating a geometry and representing the complex 3D shape. Um, but we can incorporate the macro scale through boundary conditions where we can prescribe um, muscle length changes that correspond with joint motions, as well as activation conditions within the model. Um, but we can also look at this micro scale because the model is broken down into small elements, we can prescribe micro properties to the different parts of our model and represent that behavior as well. And not only in one direction, but we can actually look at three dimensional microscopic behavior within the muscle and apneuroses. And so since we're able to model a muscle this way, why do we need to do it? Um, in building our model, we can synthesize all of these decades of research into muscles and combine them with our mathematical laws we verified. And this allows us to do some important things. So we can identify cause and effect relationships, um, things like looking at how the apneurosis morphology actually influences muscle deformation. We can use a model to perform what if scenarios. This means we can change certain things like isolated mechanical properties in our different apneurosis and see how it changes muscle behavior. And finally, we can use a model to estimate what we're not able to measure, which is really important because now we can start to understand how these complex physical architecture may play a role in function when we can't always measure what's happening. So to build our model, um, use magnetic resonance imaging, in which we segmented the soleus compartments and apneuroses to build a 3D geometry that included um, muscle apneuroses structures, and then use this to build our finite element model where we simulated lengthening during dorsiflexion by fixing the model at the bones and prescribing a distal displacement, as well as activation conditions in the two compartments of the muscle. And our model included fiber architecture to have that internal structure. Um, and these fiber directions are assigned to the um, elements of the model and then also used to reconstruct the fascicle architecture. And from this, we can measure things like the lengths and pinnation angles um, that tell us important information about the muscle, as well as allow us to compare to in vivo data. So we looked at diffusion tensor imaging, um, measuring these parameters in the compartments of the muscle to confirm that our model, which I've shown here in circles, um, is very similar in architecture. And further, these fascicles we can track with our finite element mesh um, so that as we simulate passive lengthening here, we can look at strain within the elements of model, but also calculate strain in the fascicles. So again, allowing us to verify um, our predictions through comparison now to DTI length changes. Um, the length change between a relaxed and stretched muscle and look at how the fascicle strains compare. We can also simulate now active conditions and compare the differences in strains in our compartments when the muscle has different activation during the same length changes, um, looking at both the anterior and the posterior compartments here. Further, we used our model um, now I'm showing distal displacement. So as the model stretches, we're looking at this cross section at the out of plane displacement. And we saw this non-uniformity that actually corresponded with the locations of these apneurosis. So to quantify this and define regions of interest associated with these structures so that we can look at how the displacement varied through our model. And to validate this, we did a really cool imaging study um, using MRI with eight subjects. We actually um, identified these same regions of interest around the apneurosis structures. And then using dynamic imaging, we actually imaged subjects while they actively lengthened their soleus in the scanner. Um, and by mapping these regions, we could quantify the displacement in these and saw that it was very similar to what our model was predicting, these regional displacements that are associated with the apneurosis locations. 
Um, but an, another important dynamic measure of muscle is ultrasound, um, especially because it can be used in more conditions. It can be combined with things like EMG and dynamometry. But a shortcoming of ultrasound is that it's pretty much measuring this posterior portion of the soleus. So the ultrasound probe is imaging through the gastroc into the superficial portion of the soleus. Um, same with EMG electrodes are measuring this. And so this really led to our question of what role does the anterior compartment play? And so using our model, we can simulate again lengthening um, with different activation conditions where the posterior compartments either passive or active, but the activation in the anterior compartment is varied so that we can see how it affects the posterior fascicle behavior. So we look first at fascicle strain. Um, and actually when the posterior section is passive, even as the anterior activation varies, which is here on the x-axis, the strains in the posterior compartment are pretty uniform. Um, they don't change much. And same when the um, posterior compartment is active. Now we did see more changes when the in the anterior fascicle strains with varied anterior activation in both the passive posterior and active posterior case. Um, so while this suggests the active anterior section doesn't affect the posterior compartment all that much, we then looked at force. So what I'm showing is gonna be the change in force from the condition where both sections of the muscle are passive. And as while the posterior stayed passive, as the anterior act section was activated, there was an increase in force. And same when the posterior was activated, the anterior activation led to differences in force. And so what this means is that if we're looking at metrics like muscle stiffness, where it's a relationship between force and length, the anterior section is actually gonna play a role in modulating the stiffness. So with our model, we are able to look at a lot of these structure function relationships we haven't been able to examine before, um, especially because we're able to represent important things like multi-part architecture and these complex interactions between the muscle and the passive tissues. Um, and this really helps us better interpret our in vivo measurements. Um, we can kind of combine things like DTI where we have detailed fascicle measurements with dynamic images where we have tissue deformations, um, and especially starting to combine now with ultrasound um, and functional dynamics. Um, and so the model gives us more power to interpret these where before we're kind of relying on. So this gives us much more power to then start to address changes with age. So I would just like to thank um, my lab and collaborators and the advisor, Sylvia Bunker, and then to also thank the ASB for this honor. I've been very privileged to have many mentors and friends and colleagues through this society. So thank you all and thank you for listening. Wonderful job, Katie. That was a beautiful and, and a really great presentation of, of, the, of the work you did through your PhD. Um, ha, uh, please put your questions in the chat. We've got a few minutes. Um, I would just like to comment, having read Katie's application for this award, that not only did she obviously complete a lot of wonderful scientific discovery work, um, as a part of her PhD, but a large part of Katie's PhD is spent in service, whether it's to her department, to other students on campus, and, and as we all know, to ASB. So thank you, Katie, for, for all of those roles that you've done for biomechanics. I have a question. How are you taking this work forward into your postdoc? Is a lot of this gonna be applicable? Are you gonna be able to transfer these skills directly? Yeah, I think, uh, great question. So I'm working on multi-scale modeling of athletes. So translating this work into kind of addressing now, instead of changes with age, how changes occur with training and contribute to performance. 
and further, <coughs> excuse me, um, incorporating kind of other scales as well. So thinking about um, physiologic changes, hypertrophy, muscle adaptation, and incorporating those into these models. That's awesome. So one question from Joni Bechtold, wonderful presentation. Will this be able to lead to interventions for exercises to help us improve function in aging? And congratulations. Thanks. Um, so part of kind of work that I didn't present in detail here, but we looked at how changes in kind of mechanical properties of aponeurosis change function. And I think through the model, we can kind of predict how these changes um, are going to impact muscle function. So what we can do is predict what changes would be beneficial for function. I think then there's the added element of how can we actually develop trainings and things that might cause those changes but I think with the model, it gives us ideas of new directions to go with our interventions that we may not have seen as obvious before. Thank you, Joni. Thank you so much, Katie. Please see the chat for some other questions and remind, we'll remind everybody about the spatial chat as well to continue this conversation. Um, wonderful talk, congrats, Katie. We're gonna move on now to our Early Career Achievement Award winner. And it's my honor to welcome and congratulate Aaron Mannon on receiving the Early Career Achievement Award, which recognizes early achievements by promising scientists after their PhD. Aaron is in an assistant professor role, and she is the director of the Boise Applied Biomechanics of Infants Lab in the Department of Mechanical and Biomedical Engineering at Boise State University in Idaho. So please join me in welcoming Erin to speak to us today about, is this safe for baby? Using biomechanics to explore safety of inclined sleepers. All right, thank you so much. Can everyone see the presenter screen? I don't see the green thing around it. Yes, we, we are seeing it, thank you. Okay, perfect. Uh, thank you so much. As mentioned, my name is Erin Mannon. I lead the Boise Applied Biomechanics of Infants Lab, the baby lab at Boise State University. Thank you so much to the ASB Awards Committee for selecting me as the Early Career Achievement Award recipient and for this opportunity to share my lab's unique biomechanics research. So this research is completely collaborative and I would not be talking with you right now were it not for my fabulous colleagues. The project I'm discussing with you today was funded by the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission, and the experimental work was completed in 2019 at my previous institution, the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. Babies spend hours each day in commercial products. Any new parent will tell you that they are bombarded by a plethora of options. One product promises to make your baby sleep. One product promises to make your baby eat. One product swears that your baby will be the next Albert Einstein or Paul DeVita. But we know very little about the position that these products put baby in and the impact and how they impact the baby's ability to move and use their muscles. While we know that movement and muscle activity contribute to musculoskeletal health, outside of the car seat industry, little is understood regarding how products might impact safety, especially considering suffocation scenarios. So this is what we're focused on today. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends the ABCs of safe sleep. A, alone with no blankets, pillows, toys. B, on their backs. And C, in a crib with a firm and flat mattress. However, parents will tell you that many products on the market, which babies frequently sleep in, do not follow these guidelines. These products are inclined sleepers. They were designed around 2009 and feature back incline angles ranging from 10 to 30 degrees with a seat-like design. The products were specifically marketed as infant sleep solutions for tired parents. Surprisingly, these products were sold without regulatory oversight for 10 years. The ASCM International and U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission require that some infant products like crib mattresses and car seats undergo standardized testing. But because the infant product industry evolves so rapidly, many products fall between categories and thus are left unregulated or with voluntary standards that might not sufficiently address the hazards associated with the products. In a 10 year period, over 100 deaths were reported in inclined sleep products, 
with these deaths occurring two main ways. 60% occurred when a baby was placed supine or on their backs and found supine, and about 40% occurred when a baby was placed supine on their backs and found prone on their tummies, meaning that the baby had apparently rolled over. Particularly in those supine to prone deaths, suffocation was the apparent cause. However, many parents reportedly had never observed their baby roll prior to finding them face down in the product. So it was clear that many of the deaths were movement related. And as biomechanists, we could formulate questions and experiments to understand the mechanics of these incidents. The goal of this study was to understand if the design of an inclined sleep product impacts a baby's ability to move, and if so, is safety compromised from a suffocation perspective. We use marker-based motion capture to track rigid bodies placed on the head, trunk, and pelvis, and surface EMG to measure muscle activity of the erector spinae and abdominal muscle groups. We also use a medical-grade pulse oximeter to monitor oxygen saturation levels to ensure the safety of our little participants. We tested 15 healthy full-term babies as part of this IRB-approved study. Each baby was placed in a variety of conditions, both supine on their backs and prone on their tummies for at least 30 seconds while we collected data. Sagittal plane motion and movement, trunk flexion and mean muscle activity were extracted and compared to the control condition, a flat crib mattress. The number of test conditions when oxygen sat saturation dipped below that dangerous 95% um, level was also tabulated. We first isolated the back incline angle variable and tested babies on inclined crib mattresses at zero through 30 degrees. And that study was recently published in the Journal of Biomechanics. In addition, we placed babies in several different inclined sleep products, which feature unique designs. For this portion of the study, we examined three different inclined sleep products and compared the data to the control condition a flat crib mattress, either lying prone or supine. We examined the supine and prone results separately. So starting with the supine conditions, when babies were on their backs, they experienced increased trunk flexion, less trunk movement, and a position that was more similar to a seat rather than a lying posture. These results are concerning for a few reasons. First, in adults, a seated slouched posture reduces lung capacity, lowers expiratory flow, and alters rib cage configuration and chest wall movements. We know that infant breathing is much more vulnerable than adults, so it's safe to assume that these postural implications are even more impactful for infants. Secondly, babies move their trunks less in the sagittal plane, likely because their trunk was already experiencing increased flexion. This leaves the neck segment as the only spinal segment available for babies to more easily move, which might explain why some of that, uh, those incidents that we saw had uh, the dangerous chin to chest position was documented in those supine to supine incidents. Finally, the seat feature of the products caused babies to have flexed hips simply from being placed in the product. Kobayashi et al. describes infant rolling coordination and finds that infants must coordinate movement to achieve a roll. Being placed in a flexed hip position reduces the amount of coordinated movements required to roll, which may make rolling easier for babies who couldn't ordinarily achieve a roll on a flat surface. Moving on to the prone line conditions, we found that babies experienced three times as many oxygen saturation events compared to prone lying on a flat crib mattress. Abdominal muscle activity nearly doubled in some products and erector spinae muscle activity decreased. Babies also moved their trunks more in the products compared to the flat crib mattress. These results point to a concerning situation when considering suffocation hazards. If babies find themselves prone in an inclined sleep product, their faces are close or in direct contact with the plush material, which may contribute to carbon dioxide rebreathing. We also know from previous studies that the abdominal muscles play an integral role in normal breathing. So if these muscles are now being recruited to aid in repositioning or movement, they'll be working overtime compared to a flat crib mattress scenario. This means that the abdominal muscles will likely fatigue faster, creating a dangerous scenario if the baby can't self-correct or cry out to a caregiver in time. 
The babies in our study experienced dips in oxygen saturation in just the 60 seconds time frame. So it's easy to see why extended periods of time in this position is a serious concern. The results of our study indicate that incline sleepers are unsafe for babies. The design of the incline sleeper may make it easier for babies to roll from supine to prone. And if they do roll from supine to prone, they'll likely fatigue faster and experience an increased risk of suffocation compared to a firm flat crib mattress. The combination of incline back angle, concave and seated design, lack of firmness and plush materials create a dangerous situation for babies. Our study was featured in national news media, including Consumer Reports, CBS Evening News, The Washington Post, and WebMD. As a result of our study and internal research from the Consumer Product Safety Commission, the government recalled products in the incline sleeper class. They recently announced their intent to create a mandatory safe sleep standard that products intended for infant sleep must adhere to in order to be sold in the United States. In a recent US congressional hearing, our study was cited as evidence to overturn Section 6B of the Consumer Protection Act, which essentially requires the government to keep data regarding injury or death incidents involving products a secret from the public. If it's overturned, the public will have earlier access to knowledge of infant products which have resulted in death or injury, resulting in a safer world for babies. On account of this collaborative research, Kids in Danger, the nation's leading nonprofit on pediatric injury prevention, awarded me with our, their 2021 Best Friend Award for our team's contribution to, infant, to safe infant products. Our biomechanics research is making waves on a national level, is helping to change the landscape of infant product safety evaluation and practice, and I believe is saving babies' lives. While thankfully car seat and crash biomechanics are studied and some work has been done in the 1970s uh, into baby walkers, the research into infant movement and product interaction from a musculoskeletal development and safety perspective is largely unexplored. Our study on incline sleep products will hopefully be one of many to translate infant biomechanics from the lab to the commercial baby gear industry. In that vein, we are continuing to study motor skills and milestones like infant rolling, both to understand healthy and eventually unhealthy development, and to think about how rolling is impacted by commercial baby gear. The limitations of lab-based methods with babies are real, so we're also developing methods to analyze movement outside the lab. There's a lot of baby gear out there, and the baby lab would love to collaborate with anyone who's interested in this work. It's safe to say that biomechanics is the 21st century's breakthrough science. I hope this short talk will inspire you to think about how we as an inclusive community can leverage biomechanics to help our smallest and most vulnerable members of our society, babies. Thank you again for the Early Achievement Award. Uh, here's my email and Twitter handle and a shameless plug for interested postdocs um, starting January 2022. I would happily take any questions. Wonderful, Erin. I think I speak for everyone in saying congratulations, and we're so thankful you're doing the work that you're doing. I think this is such a personal topic that touches almost all of us. So awesome. So there are many questions, and we're not going to get to them all. So I'm going to just start at the top, and we'll I'll see what we can do in a few minutes, and then you'll be able to answer them in the chat afterwards. But we'll start with a question from David Lips. Where do products like swings and bounce chairs fall in terms of being investigated and certified? While not intended for sleeping, I know I'm not alone in having a kid fall asleep in one of those for a nap. That's gonna be, a, that's a great question. And that's gonna be a huge discussion with the, the government has to deal with over the next year. Uh, they're going to be implementing this safe sleep standard, which doesn't exist. And we don't really know what's going to be in it at this point that is for products intended for infant sleep. But exactly like you said, babies fall asleep in many places. So it's gonna be interesting to see how manufacturers um, and regulatory bodies handle um, a product that looks like it's for sleep, but isn't marketed for sleep. Uh, so there aren't really any good answers right now, but that's definitely uh, an astute observation. So a follow on to that, um... Uh, from Paul DeVita. Um, will you be involved in setting the standards for these infant projects? Because we all hope so. 
So I'm sorry, what was that? Who would be involved? Will you be involved specifically? Um, I have a continuing relationship with the United States Consumer Product Safety Commission. So our lab um, is very interested in helping direct um, what should or maybe shouldn't be included in these standards, but it's not up to us. Um, it's, it's a body, right now it's a body of folks who are represented from, man, from industry, um, foundations and you know personal interest. So it's a it's a changing it's a changing environment and people are starting to take notice. So I'm really happy that we as biomechanists um, are playing a role in in these important conversations. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Erin, um, for this really impactful research and for sharing with us today. And um, congrats again to you and Katie on these really really deserving awards for you too. And please Thank you. see the chat for more questions and congratulations. Thanks, Erin. All right, everybody. Now we are up for the journal awards. And so I want to explain just a little bit about this. It's a curious year, as you might have noticed when you've seen the award announcements. Um, so the journal award finalists are chosen from all of the abstracts submitted to the conference. So every single abstract is scored by three independent reviewers. And then this year we took the top, the 10 top scoring abstracts that were reviewed. Um, and those 10 were classified as JLB or clinical biomechanics abstracts, wherein we had five in each category. So those five were then reviewed and scored in a blinded format by the awards committee. And two finalists for each award are here to speak with us today. Because of my personal conflict with the abstracts, the awards management this year was handled and will continue to be handled until the winner is chosen and by Michelle Sabek. And then winners will be announced on Friday during the business meeting at 3 p.m. Eastern. So thank you all. And first up, we have Sean Ahuja. Um, so congratulations, Sean, for being chosen as a finalist. And Sean is gonna speak to us about the metabolic cost of walking balance control and adaptation in young adults. Thanks, Sean. All right, thanks again. Um, my name is Sean Ahuja, and I'm a third year medical student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And today, I'd like to convince you that the strategies we use for walking balance control and adaptation is affected by metabolic cost. So to start, we know that older adults consume metabolic energy approximately 20% faster than younger adults when walking in their communities. This can accelerate fatigue and negatively impact quality of life and independence. Unfortunately, the mechanisms for this have remained elusive. Increased muscle, increased antagonist muscle coactivation appears to contribute some, which older adults likely use to increase joint stiffness in exchange for a greater metabolic cost. Our research group has also shown that redistribution to more proximal leg muscles comes with a metabolic penalty as older adults rely more so than younger ones on less economic muscles spanning the hip and knee. However, we suspect that a large part of the variance in increased metabolic costs of walking in older adults is left unexplained when you consider these factors alone. The focus of our recent work has been to explore whether older adults have a disproportionate metabolic energy cost of lateral stability in walking as they try to safely navigate their communities. One way our field has set out to study and understand the neuromuscular control of lateral stability is through the use of balance perturbations. And in 2012, Sean O'Connor showed that the metabolic energy cost of walking increased with optical flow balance perturbations. In essence, these perturbations, which you can see in this video from our lab on the left, give the visual perception of lateral instability. The results were quite clear. Maintaining balance in the face of those perturbations appear to exact a metabolic penalty associated with increased gait variability. However, those metabolic changes associated with lateral stability reflected average outcomes after several minutes of responding to perturbations. Intuitively, we might adapt to balance challenges and in a real world setting, especially in populations with chronic instability, such as older adults, the interaction between how we respond to balance challenges and the impact on walking metabolism may be highly complex. So what happens with prolonged exposure? This is actually something that we don't fully understand 
even in healthy young adults. Fortunately, our prior work has provided at least a little bit of insight here. We've previously found that both younger and older adults respond to the onset of these perturbations with wider and shorter steps to accompany their increased step-to-step -step variability. Doing so increases lateral stability by better positioning the body's center of mass within the base of support. We and others have interpreted this initial response as generalized anticipatory control. However, with prolonged exposure to the same perturbations, subjects abandon or at least deprioritize the strategy as step width and length return the values seen during unperturbed walking and the perturbations themselves are better accommodated simply through step-to-step -step corrections. We interpret this as evidence of a shift from generalized anticipatory control to task-specific reactive control. We've hypothesized that this time-dependent adaptation is in part driven by a disproportionate metabolic energy cost of the early generalized anticipatory control strategy. However, no study to our knowledge has yet to simultaneously measure these indicators of generalized anticipatory versus task-specific reactive control and their respective metabolic penalties during the onset of an adaptation to continuous optical flow balance perturbations. Underneath this effect could be the basis for developing clinical countermeasures, such as wearables or balance training to help mitigate walking-related fatigue and falls risk in our older adult population. And so the purpose of our study was to quantify the role of metabolic energy cost in governing neuromuscular adaptation to prolonged exposure to optical flow perturbations during walking in young adults. Our first hypothesis was that metabolic costs would increase at first as participants would walk with shorter, wider, and more variable steps. Our second hypothesis was that metabolic costs would decrease after a prolonged time as step width and step length returned back to baseline values seen during normal, unperturbed walking. And so for our experimental methodology, we had our participants start with a five minute warm up at their preferred walking speed. We then had them do five minutes of unperturbed walking, followed by 10 minutes of perturbed walking, and finishing off with another five minutes of unperturbed walking for a total 20 minute continuous walking bout. For our analysis in this presentation, we define pre as the two minutes of unperturbed walking before the perturbation started, early as the first two minutes of the perturbations, and late as the last two minutes of the perturbations. For our participant demographics, we have 18 healthy young adults, 10 identifying as male, eight identifying as female, with an average age of 23.3 years. For our primary outcomes, we had step kinematics, namely step width, step length, and the respective variabilities, and net metabolic power, each averaged over the two minute time periods of interest. So on the left, you'll see our results for step kinematics, center, gait variability, and on the right, metabolic power. At the onset of perturbations, we saw a significant increase in step width decrease in step length, and an increase in the respective variabilities. Specifically, we saw 3% shorter steps, 17% wider steps, and 53% more variable steps. This is consistent with our early interpretation of a generalized anticipatory control strategy in response to the onset of balance perturbations. Unfortunately, we found that this strategy comes with significant metabolic penalty as net metabolic power increased by a significant 12% compared to unperturbed walking. Perturbations, we saw that step width and step length tended to return to unperturbed values despite sustained levels of step-to-step -step variability. This last point is important because it shows that our subjects are still susceptible to the perturbations, but have shifted their strategy to one we would associate with task-specific reactive control. However, as the most significant work, we have found that this shift strategy used to accommodate the perturbations offered a significant 5% savings in net metabolic power compared to that at their onset. And so revisiting our initial hypotheses, 
We first found that maintaining lateral balance at the onset of perturbations, at least for the type of magnitude studied here, demands a 12% metabolic penalty. And we would therefore accept our first hypothesis. Then, with prolonged exposure, a return of step width and length to unperturbed values is accompanied by a 5% savings in metabolic cost, which supports our second hypothesis. So where do we go from here? Although we didn't include EMG measurements in the study, our prior work has shown that both younger and older adults respond to optical flow perturbations with greater antagonist coactivation, and that this coactivation, at least in older adults, decreases following prolonged exposure. We therefore suspect that antagonist coactivation will provide a neuromechanical explanation for the changes in metabolic energy costs associated with adopting generalized anticipatory versus task-specific reactive control. And we plan to include this in future studies. In addition, now that we have a better understanding of the metabolic cost of walking balance control and adaptation in young adults, we're eager to return to the lab to determine how aging influences the association between balance control and walking metabolism to further inform balance training modalities and adaptive technologies aimed at reducing fatigability and falls risks. And so our key takeaways were that the initial perturbation response comes with a significant metabolic penalty as, a, as demonstrated by the 12% higher metabolic cost. Additionally, prolonged exposure leads to task-specific reactive control, as we saw participants return to normal baseline step kinematics with sustained step-to-step -step variability. Finally, we found that metabolic energy costs may shape the strategies used for walking balance, as this adaptation and balance control permitted a 5% reduction in metabolic energy costs. I'd like to thank Dr. Jason Franz for his continued mentorship and guidance on this project. The Applied Biomechanics Laboratory of UNC and NC State's Joint BME Department for housing this project and the UNC School of Medicine Alumni Fund for funding. Lastly, I'd like to take a moment to recognize and congratulate my fellow lab member, Cal Funk, as the other finalists for the Journal of Biomechanics Award. Thank you. Wonderful job, Sean. That was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Folks, please put your uh, questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I'll start off acknowledging that the two, uh, both of these talks from the same lab was, I don't know if that's ever happened before, but very exciting for Jason and, and his laboratory to have such um, high quality work um, out, of, out of many of your abstracts. So wonderful. I wondered, while it's a small sample size, so I understand the limitations of this, did you see any differing um, outcomes between your self-identified male and female participants? Were there any sort of differences in the outcomes were you able to look at that? Um, you know, now that you mentioned it, that is an interesting uh, element to examine. Um, we didn't formally look at the differences between the two of that. Um, but when you kind of consider sort of, say, osteoporotic risks in the older adult population and sort of the sex bias, I think that would be another possible future direction to take this work and perhaps something that we can maybe re-examine our existing data and see if a difference does exist. Great, thank you. And then another follow-up question from your key takeaways um, where you see that really significant metabolic cost change, and then how folks are reverting kind of back. Do any of these sort of give you hints at what you would think would be um, appropriate inter interventions for older adults or how you might translate that directly? Yeah, so interestingly enough, uh, we have done prior work uh, showing that older adults can at least be kind of conditioned through a virtual reality medium, similar to what we use in this uh, experiment to sh shift towards a task-specific reactive control. And kind of thinking in that line, I would, especially with sort of the widespread availability of VR technology and the re relative cost effectiveness, I think that would be the primary sort of intervention that we would try to continue to hone, develop, and try to push. Um, but I think as we do future work with uh, the EMG findings, the role of wearables might have an additional impact, 
in terms of seeing sort of the differences between the two balance control strategies. Great, thank you so much, Sean. Thank you for this presentation and congratulations on being a finalist for thank the General again. Biomechanics Award. All right, well, we are gonna move on now to Callum Funk, who is also a, a finalist for this award. And Callum will be sharing with us uh, his study titled Exploring the Functional Boundaries and Metabolism, uh, Metabolism of Triceps Surrey Force Link Relations During Walking. Thanks for the intro, I appreciate it. Uh, yes, so I'm Callum Funk, an undergraduate at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill member of the Joint Department of Biomedical Engineering with NC State. And today I'm gonna to be talking about the triceps surrey, their force length relations and how they affect the metabolic energy costs of walking. And before I start, I'd like to give uh, thanks to the ASB for giving me the special privilege of presenting today and to uh, Sean, my fellow lab member for all the kind words. So let's begin. So let me to start with our driving motivation as America's population gets older, a major concern is how aging affects our mobility. Older adults walk slower with a higher metabolic cost and with lower push-off power than young adults. And these changes can contribute to a loss of independence and reduce quality of life. Our calf muscles, also known as the triceps surrey, are the primary contributors to propulsive force during walking. And the triceps surrey, like all muscles, are able to produce different amounts of force depending on the length of the muscle fascicles. In healthy young adults, the triceps surrey operate in a narrow region of muscle lengths to optimize the amount of force that can be produced. And by operating near the peak of this curve, less active muscle volume is needed to meet the force demands of walking. When you operate outside of this narrow region, each muscle fiber can produce less force, so more muscle volume is needed to meet force demands, and this may in turn increase metabolic cost. Recent data from Beck et al. has shown that shorter calf muscle fascicle lengths during isolated contractions are associated with higher metabolic costs of muscle force generation, at least in isometric contractions. And this brings me back to our driving motivation. So unfortunately, it seems that this shift out of the optimal fascicle length region might be exactly what we see happening in older adults who tend to operate their triceps surrey muscle, muscles at shorter fascicle lengths than younger adults during walking. And the cumulative evidence I've shown you thus far serves to motivate our line of research, which aims to delay the onset and or mitigate walking-related fatigue to improve independence specifically for older adults. So we see this length change between older and younger adults, but when you compare two different populations like this, it's difficult to tell exactly what's happening uh, because of the sheer number of changes due to aging. So that's why for this study, we used muscle activation biofeedback to manipulate the interplay between neural drive and muscle fascicle length during walking, uh, thereby allowing us to study the effect of fascicle length on the metabolic cost of walking in a more controllable manner. So from this, we developed two hypotheses. Hypothesis one suggests that high activation of the triceps surrey will cause high metabolic cost via shortened muscle fascicle length. And hypothesis two is the inverse of this, where we predict that low activation of the triceps surrey will cause lower metabolic cost via longer muscle fascicle lengths. So to test these hypotheses, our study used 20 healthy young adults in two distinct phases, an isometric contraction phase and a treadmill walking phase. The isometric contraction phase was used to establish each individual subject's force length relation by having them perform a series of maximal voluntary isometric contractions while seated in a dynamometer at a variety of ankle joint angles. And in the second phase, subjects walked on an instrumented treadmill while EMG sensors measured uh, the uh, level of triceps surrey activation on their calves. And this EMG data was processed in real time and subjects were given five different push-off activation targets in different walking trials. And throughout these trials, uh, ultrasound of the medial gastrocnemius fascicles was collected 
and the subject's metabolic energy consumption was monitored with indirect calorimetry. In this study, we used a deep learning tool to train individual neural networks for each subject that are able to identify a specific muscle fascicle across multiple ultrasound videos and calculate the length and pination angle of the fascicle at a given moment. And using this information, we can calculate the force produced by the medial gastric nemius using the pination angle, ankle moment, subject specific Achilles tendon moment arm, and estimates of the relative physiological cross-sectional area of the medial gastric nemius relative to the triceps surrey as a whole. And you know, now that we've established these methods, we can kind of transition into the results. So first and foremost, how did our biofeedback paradigm perform at actually altering subjects peak triceps surrey activation? So here on the x-axis, we can see the five different triceps surrey activation targets ranging from minus 40 to plus 40%, which is also represented by the dotted line. And on the y-axis, we can see the measured level of triceps surrey activation that subjects actually achieved during push-off. And here we can see that activation did increase and decrease when we uh, asked subjects to do that, but uh, they weren't able to decrease their activation quite as much as um, we asked them to, which is represented by deviations from the dotted line on sort of the left side of the graph here. In this next figure, uh, the x-axis is the same, but now uh, we are looking at the peak force generated by the medial gastric nemius uh, at the five different volitional triceps surrey activation targets. And uh, as we can see, there's a sort of gradual linear increase where as they activated more, they produce more force. Not incredibly surprising. But here's kind of where it gets interesting. So on this next slide on the y-axis, we're looking at metabolic power, net metabolic power. And again, the x-axis is the triceps surrey activation target. Interestingly, we found that metabolic power, which is the whole body rate of metabolic energy consumption, didn't follow a linear trend, but instead is U-shaped, where the cost of walking was minimized at normal activation. Any deviations from normal triceps surrey activation led to increases in metabolic costs, in some cases, very large increases. This is kind of intuitive because we likely choose our preferred activation to minimize energy expenditure. Since this trend is not linear, like the force plot I showed you on the previous slide, it also suggests that the amount of force being generated by the calf is not the sole determinant of metabolic cost. Now on the y-axis, we have medial gastric nemius muscle fascicle length at the moment of peak force in the stride. As I mentioned earlier, some recent evidence suggests that muscle fascicle length may be relevant to the metabolic cost of muscle force generation. Here we can see that subjects operated their medial gastroc at shorter lengths than normal when they deviated from normal muscle activation. So both increases and decreases in triceps surrey activation led to shorter muscle fascicle lengths, at least at the moment of peak force. When we compare it to the metabolic power plot I just showed previously, we can see that fascicle length seems to follow kind of an inverse trend of metabolic power, sort of a more subtle upside down U shape here. And let's look closer on the next slide at how fascicle length and power might be related. So when we look closer, we find that metabolic energy cost is actually closely correlated with fascicle length. Here we have a repeated measures correlation plot where basically we fit a series of parallel lines to the data from each subject. And each color on the screen right now represents uh, an individual subject's data across the five different walking conditions. We found that decreased fascicle length was associated pretty strongly with increased metabolic energy costs during walking. And this result supports our overall hypothesis then corroborates previous evidence by demonstrating that shortened muscle fascicle lengths appear to increase the metabolic cost of walking. And it suggests that manipulating muscle fascicle length may be a valid technique for interventions that aim to change the energy required for walking. We think our results in young adults shed light on a possible mechanistic framework for interpreting how it is that age-related anatomical changes 
can lead to increased metabolic cost of walking in older adults. Evidence suggests that as people age, their Achilles tendon might be getting more compliant. And in response, older adults might have to compensate with increased activation and shorter muscle fascicle lengths in their triceps surrey, which we have demonstrated here uh, can lead to higher energy costs in young adults. And our results also suggest that steering muscle fascicles to longer operating lengths might be beneficial for reducing the energy cost of walking. And we think that an individual's specific force length relation might be useful for designing tailored assistive devices like passive elastic exoskeletons to improve push-off force and reduce energy cost in individuals with impaired and reduced mobility, such as older adults. By collecting ultrasound and dynamics data during both isometric and walking trials for each subject, this study design has given us the capability to plot where in a subject's individual force length relation they're operating throughout the stride in different activation conditions. Here on screen, we can see where in the force length behavior, uh, subjects were operating throughout stance and at the moment of peak force. And we can see how this has changed by altering activation. I think the most exciting way to use this data is to look at how an individual is moving throughout their force length operating space during the stride. And we think that using an individual's specific force length relation like this to understand how their muscles are operating during functional tasks like walking may offer greater insight into the neuromuscular determinants of metabolic cost and more broadly, how we explore the functional boundaries of our muscles in everyday life. I'd like to give special thanks to our collaborators at the Power Lab at Georgia Tech, to my co-authors, all the members of the Applied Biomechanics Lab, and to our funding sources at the NIH. Thank you for all your time. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Great job, Callum. Thank you so much for a fantastic talk. So we've got a few questions here. We'll just get started and see what we can get through. So from our president-elect, Dr. Chom, we have a question. Great talk and very interesting. So exposing subjects to visual perturbation requires central sensory reweighing to maintain balance and thus increased attention and cognitive load. Do you think this mechanism contributes to changes in gait speed and thus metabolic costs or is it all motor? Was that question meant for me or Sean? Oh. I am so sorry. Okay, well, moderator fail. Sorry, Callum. Sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. There we go from Jennifer Nichols. Thanks for a great talk. Thanks, Callum, for picking up on that. Two questions. Perhaps I missed it, but how much training did you provide? Was it challenging for subjects to learn to increase or decrease their activation? That's a great question. Yeah. So um, subjects had the opportunity to practice uh, as much as they wanted uh, to get at the hang of, you know, how do you volitionally control your triceps area activation? They didn't have a very hard time increasing, but as we saw in that one slide, they did have a hard time decreasing their triceps area activation to all the way down to like minus 40% from the norm. And we think that just might be evidence that, you know, during normal walking, you don't have a lot of whatever the opposite of headroom is, you don't have a lot of room to go down any further. You're already kind of near the minimum activation state that you can exist at. So they did have trouble going down, um, which was reflected in the data. Great, thank you. So there's a follow-up question from Jennifer. So I'll ask for you to answer that later in the chat and we'll jump to another person. So um, from Juane Swinnen, great presentation, Callum. I wonder how spatial, spatial temporal parameters changed when imposing different activation. The lower activation means shorter stride length. Uh, we haven't taken a look at exactly all the kinematic parameters. I mean, there's, there's so many things that, so many great questions that could be asked here. And I think this is gonna, those are all questions we're gonna assess in sort of future analyses of this same data set. Um, there are some, measurable differences in things like uh, muscle tendon unit length, which is kind of reflective of certain kinematic parameters. Um, but they all seemed, at least the ones we analyzed, uh, seemed to travel fairly linearly with activation. So we saw 
some sort of linear relationship between low activation, low, high activation, high. And the reason we thought uh, muscle fascicle length was specifically interesting is because it seemed to stand out as the only thing we could find, at least yet so far, that has this unique nonlinear relationship, some sort of U-shaped thing, which fell in line with our um, appraisal of metabolic cost as well. Wonderful, Callum. Great answers. Great questions, everybody. And then Callum, please go into the chat so you can see some of the other questions. And uh, apologies again for getting the wrong question talk. Um, you know, trying to operate a few different things here. Thank you, everybody. But we will move on to our clinical biomechanics finalists now. All right. And so first up is Omid Jahanian. And Omen, can you share your slides now? And Omen will be speaking to us about IMU-derived ergonomic metrics measured during daily life may differentiate manual wheelchair users with spinal cord injury with and without rotator cuff pathology progression. Thanks, Omen. Thank you for the introduction. Can you hear me, Bill? Yes. All right, great. Now, I'm so excited to share with you the work we have been doing to develop metrics for assessing arm use in mammal wheelchair users with SCI in the free living environment. Uh, as it is depicted in this plot of tendon pathology versus age, rotator cuff degeneration is considered a normal aspect of human aging. Unfortunately, among persons with spinal cord injury, the natural history of rotator cuff pathology progression is accelerated which is theorized to be due to overuse of their upper limbs during daily living and manual wheelchair use. Therefore, characterization of arm use and identification of metrics that are associated with high incidence and increased rate of pathology progression in manual wheelchair users with SCI is necessary. Similar to manual wheelchair users, manual workers are dependent on their musculoskeletal health for their livelihood and they are at high risk of overuse injuries. There is an abundance of research on industrial ergonomics to investigate and uh, maintain active arm use among manual laborers. And in this study, we use these approaches as a model to better understand risk factors among manual wheelchair users. Actually, the arm use metrics defined in this study were guided by the work conducted by Lynn and colleagues. Uh, our, our overall objective in this study was uh, to measure daily arm use of manual wheelchair use with um, SCI using inertial measurement units in the free living environment. Inspired from ergonomics literature, we defined risk and recovery metrics to assess the arm use in manual wheelchair users. Our first objective was to test the ability uh, ability of these risk and recovery metrics to differentiate between manual wheelchair users with SCI and a matched able bodied cohort. And our second objective was to test the ability of these metrics to differentiate between two subgroups of manual wheelchair users, those with rotator cuff pathology progression over one year from those whose rotator cuff imaging findings remain stable. Uh, for objective one, uh, we used the IMU data from uh, 34 manual wheelchair users with SCI and 34 age and sex match able bodied individuals. And for objective two, we used the data from two separate MRI studies, uh, approximately one year apart. And the, MRI, the, and the IMU data collected sometime between the two MRI visits in 16 manual wheelchair users. Uh, for IMU data collection, as you see in this figure, uh, we asked the participants to wear three IMUs, one on, uh, the, on each upper arm and one on their chest. The IMU data was collected for one or two days. Additionally, uh, participants were asked to perform a functional calibration at the beginning of each day. Acceleration and angular velocity data from the IMU and um, calibration postures were used to calculate the humeral elevation angles using a custom method code. To determine the static or dynamic status of each arm, the signal magnitude area, SMA, was calculated from the acceleration data for each second. An SMA threshold of 0 0.60 7G was applied to differentiate between static and dynamic periods. 
using the results uh, from the ergonomic literature and our observations in our previous studies, we defined risk as one second or greater of humeral elevation over 60 degrees. And recovery is at least five consecutive seconds of static arm at humeral elevation lower than 40 degrees. These definitions for recovery and risk were applied to the uh, calculated data and metrics of duration and frequency of risk and recovery events and risk to recovery ratio were calculated for each 10 minute period across the full day. Uh, here you can see uh, distribution of risk and recovery metrics of arm use for a representative SCI participant. Uh, green is for recovery and uh, red is for uh, risk uh, periods. Clinical bilateral MRI of shoulders of 16 manual wheelchair users were collected at two visits approximately one year apart. The images of the rotator cuff muscles, including supraspinatus, infraspinatus, subscapularis, and teres minor, were assessed by a board certified musculoskeletal radiologist. A scoring system based on the continuum of rotator cuff tendon pathology was used to, for scoring the MRI assessment in which more pathologic points were given to higher grades of pathology from mild tendinopathy through uh, full thickness tear. Here uh, you can see examples of shoulder images with uh, progression of rotator cuff tendon pathology in two monoliochi users. A and B are for progression of supraspinatus uh, tendinopathy from mild tendinopathy at baseline visit to uh, moderate tendinopathy at year one, and C and D uh, are progression of uh, supraspinatus tendon tear uh, from intermediate grade partial thickness tear, thickness tear at baseline visit to high grade partial thickness tear at year one. Um, for statistical analysis for objective one, Wilcoxon sign rank tests were used, and for objective two, man with EU tests uh, were used in SPSS. For objective one, the average age of the SCI participants was 43 years, average time since injury was 12 years, and we had participants across injury levels. For objective two, uh, also uh, the average age of uh, SCI participant was four, 41, and time since injury was 11 years. Uh, the results for objective one uh, from comparison between the two cohorts indicated that uh, the frequency of risk events was significantly higher in the manual wheelchair users than the uh, matched able-bodied participants. This seems intuitive as uh, manual wheelchair users need to interact with the environment from a mostly seated position. The results for the recovery metrics indicated that uh, manual wheelchair users spent longer time in recovery than the able-bodied cohort, which was opposite to our, ex uh, to our expectations. This might be due to the sedentary lifestyle, which is more co common among, uh, among manual wheelchair users than the general population. The results for the rest of the metrics were not significantly different between the two cohorts. As it was mentioned before, for objective to 16 manual wheelchair users with SCI participated in two MRI studies approximately one year apart. The results from the uh, baseline uh, MRI indicated that uh, the prevalence of any tendinopathy across the rotator cuff tendons was 96%, and the prevalence of any tendon tears was 56%. The results for the second MRI indicated that five participants experienced progression of rotator cuff tendon pathology, and for the rest of them, I mean, for 11 participants, the rotator cuff imaging findings remained stable. The results for objective two indicated that manual wheelchair users with progression of rotator cuff pathology spend a significantly longer time at risky posture than those without uh, progression of rotator cuff pathology. The frequency of risk events was also significantly higher in the manual wheelchair users with pathology progression. As it was expected, the manual wheelchair users with progression of rotator cuff pathology spend a significantly shorter time in uh, recovery than those with, uh, without progression of rotator cuff pathology. The frequency of uh, recovery events was also significantly lower in the manual wheelchair users with pathology progression. 
About recovery metrics, it is important to mention that still uh, we need research to validate criteria for periods of operating physiological recovery. And finally, uh, the uh, risk to recovery ratio was significantly higher in the manual VLG users with progression of rotator cuff pathology than those without progression. This indicated that a balance is distribution of recovery and risk is needed to maintain a healthy rotator cuff. The positive ratio in those with pathology progression means that in average, they spend longer time at uh, risky postures than in recovery, which might lead to an accelerated rotator cuff uh, degeneration. Or in the future direction that a metric such as this uh, multifactorial ratio could take is to be utilized as a biofeedback index in interventional studies. Uh, the results of this study indicated that uh, the risk in uh, recovery metrics of arm use uh, have the potential to differentiate progression of rotator cuff pathology in manual users with SCI. Therefore, there is a clinical interest in characterizing arm use profiles of manual users whose rotator cuff health remains relatively stable over time. This information um, might have the potential to uh, help manual users to improve or at least maintain their upper limb function. Uh, as it is uh, illustrated in these uh, diagrams, uh, rotator cuff disease is a multifactorial problem. Risk factors that are associated with uh, pathology progression include, but are not limited to, uh, risk and recovery metrics of arm use reported in this study. The informative value of the data reported in this study might be limited by the exclusion of uh, measurement of forces and moments that contribute to shoulder loading. Additionally, it is important to uh, study other potential risk factors that influence the structural capacity of the tendon and um, protective factors that may help improve or maintain the health of rotator cuff tendons in uh, manual wheelchair users with SCI. Um, future studies will include more days of IMU data collection, uh, a larger sample size and longer follow-up uh, are warranted to fully investigate the associations between risk and recovery metrics of arm use with progression of rotator cuff tendon pathology and also to validate the definitions of risk and recovery. Uh, with that, I'd like to thank our team at Mayo Clinic and University of Michigan. Uh, I would also like to appreciate research participants and acknowledge our funding sources. And uh, I would appreciate uh, ASP for uh, providing me this opportunity to uh, present our research. Thank you. Nice job, Omen. Thank you so much for that talk. All right, we will open up to questions. We have one here. I hope it's really for you um, from Jennifer Nichols. Thanks for a great talk. I understand the results you shared were st statistically significant. Can you comment on which ones, meaning which factors are most important in terms of clinical significance? Yeah, and in addition, you. hold on, would you design an intervention to minimize duration or number of risk events? Um, yeah, for about the first question, yeah, th that's a great question. And um, uh, yeah, for, among the um, metrics which we had, uh, you know, metrics of arm risk, uh, metrics of risk uh, of arm use and uh, risk, uh, to ratio, risk to recovery ratio were the most important metrics in this study. But honestly, because of the small sample size, I cannot talk about the clinical significance but uh, the results shows a promising results. Um, so this is our, the future direction of this study to collect with more participants and uh, also longer follow-up time because in this study, we had just one year follow-up. So to, to better understand uh, about, or to, to kind of um, investigate about the clinical significance of these metrics and about the intervention, yes, we are hopeful to have an interventional study um, using these metrics for our participants. But at first, uh, we need to optimize, we need to kind of uh, clearly uh, um, define and validate the definitions we have for 
uh, risk and recovery of arm use uh, in this population. And then uh, next step will be uh, interventional study to see uh, how they can be helpful for this population. Thanks, Omid. So follow-up question to that, in terms of the validation, how are you looking to validate or better understand the recovery, the idea of recovery for the arm? Yeah, there are different, what we have started now, uh, you know, it's using uh, EMG uh, to see, okay, where, where can be the um, kind of physiological recovery for uh, shoulder muscles? That's one way, or that, that, that can kind of help us to validate uh, uh, the recovery. And also, you know, another, another way we can validate these metrics, including recovery, is what we did exactly in this study to compare them, uh, to look at their associations with um, clinical data, which we have, I mean, the MRI results. That's another way we can see if um, these uh, metrics make sense or not. Great, thank you so much, Omid. Thanks for a great talk and congratulations on being a finalist. We will move to our last finalist now. And so lastly, we will hear from Anna Ibrahimi speaking to us about redistribution of muscular work by children with cerebral palsy, walking and crouch. Thanks, Anna, and congratulations. Thank you so much. I'm really honored to be here and share this research on behalf of my co-authors. Um, I'll just start with disclosing that we are funded by the NIH and two of our co-authors are co-inventors on a patent for uh, tensiometer technology used in this study. So it's well reported now that children with cerebral palsy or CP have two to three times higher metabolic costs compared to typically developing children. And if we look at this video of a child walking in crouch gait, we can hypothesize that as the crouch knee angle becomes greater, it requires more muscular strength to walk in that posture, which therefore might contribute to this elevated metabolic, metabolic cost. Um, however, what is surprising is that Dr. Kat Steele and colleagues found that crouch severity defined by knee flexion angle on the x-axis was very weakly correlated with oxygen consumption on the y-axis. Um, and for reference, that red dot represents oxygen consumption from typical developing children. So even kids walking relatively upright are still using more metabolic energy. So to understand the elevated cost of metabolic energy, we could begin to look at the mechanical work of muscle tendon level. And there's a few reasons why muscle tendon mechanics could be altered in CP. Um, for example, researchers have found that children with spastic CP have structural changes to the muscle, uh, including evidence of smaller muscle bellies and longer tendons. We also see changes in muscle tendon properties. So for example, children with CP are, uh, have stiffer muscle tendons than typical developing. And there's a lot of research supporting poor motor control in children with CP. So here is showing uh, dynamic motor control on the y-axis is reduced with uh, the severity of cerebral palsy. Now, we don't necessarily know which of these factors is dominant, but we do suspect there is sort of a net effect of all of these in altering muscle tendon functional behavior or mechanical work done by the muscle tendon unit in CP. And that's really what we are trying to study is this functional behavior. And when we think about uh, muscle tendon unit level work or behavior, uh, cyclic, uh, and during cyclic tasks, uh, we can think of work loops. And these are plots that are created when the force and change in length of the material is plotted during a cyclic task. And there's a really nice paper by Dr. Dickinson and colleagues uh, showing this in anim animal models. Um, so for example, on the left, you can see a counterclockwise work loop. Um, and in that case, you have counterclockwise uh, a work loop, you have the net area being positive within the loop, and therefore you're muscle is acting like a motor. Conversely, a muscle that is uh, clockwise, showing a clockwise work loop, will have net negative work um, between the curves, and that can be said to be acting as a brake. Um, we can also observe a muscle tendons acting like a spring, where there is very minimal net work done on the system, and work is just sort of redirected throughout the system. 
So our goal was to understand the work production of the quadriceps and triceps surrey, these are our leg extensors, during crouch gait in children with CP. Um, now to get work loops in human gait, we need to quantify both these force and excursion metrics. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to look at excursion. What we did is uh, ultimately uh, look at the change in length of the tendon about the joint. So for the triceps surrey or the Achilles, um, we computed uh, the change in length of the uh, muscle tendon by integrating the Achilles tendon moment arm with respect to the ankle dorsiflexion angle during gait. Similarly, we can integrate patellar tendon moment arm with respect to the knee flexion angle for a quadriceps excursion. Now to get muscle tendon force, muscle models are often used, um, but the trouble there is that assumptions that we use in muscle models are not often valid for CP, as we mentioned earlier, for motor control and so on. Um, but what's exciting is that new technology that we developed in uh, the UW Madison Neuromuscular Biomechanics Lab uh, shows that we can use true wave tensiometry, tensiometry to track muscle tendon force in vivo during dynamic tasks. So the tensiometer taps really fast on the tendon. There's a wave generated through the tendon and is picked up by miniature accelerometers in, a, in an array. And using a tension beam model, tendon force is directly dependent on shear wave speed. And we can see uh, from one of the images from Dr. Martin's paper that uh, wave speed is really nicely tracking tendon loading throughout the gait cycle. So before I uh, get into the data, I'll note that we recently published a study in gait and posture looking at tendon loading across a range of walking speeds in typically developing children. So if you'd like uh, to see what uh, that looks like, the tensiometry data looks like um, in the Achilles across walking speeds. Uh, it kind of looks similar to an ankle moment curve, but if you can see my mouse here, uh, we do also get this peak in late swing phase um, corresponding to uh, stress from, from uh, dorsiflexing the ankle. Uh, so we're getting some unique data there. And then, um, you know, we have patellar stress also showed two peaks sort of where we expect, right, with a significant increase in peak stress during loading response with faster walking speed. So now that we kind of knew what to expect in typical developing children, we went over to Gillette. Um, we were very fortunate to collaborate with them, collect 15 typically developing controls and 11 children with CP. Um, and the children with CP had a range of backgrounds, but all were ambulatory GMFCS levels one or two, and all had received prior surgery. Um, we measured the standard gait analysis, the joint kinematics, kinetics, EMG, in addition to our uh, new wave speed measures as well. Um, so I'll show you again, this is going to be tricep surrey um, data about the ankle. And on the left, you'll see the time series data for excursion at the top, force in the middle, and EMG at the bottom. So excursion um, was normalized to leg length. We did a subject-specific calibration to estimate muscle tendon force from shear wave speed, um, and then forces were normalized to body weight, and then EMG was normalized to its peak. So each of these metrics is dimensionless, um, and the standard deviations are shown in, in shaded there. So then we can, it's pretty cool, we can combine all these plots into one single figure that shows the work loops. And overlaid on top of uh, this work loop is the EMG activity. Um, so you see the medial gastroc EMG activity there. Um, and if you haven't seen work loops before, here's kind of how it relates to the gait cycle. So just a, a note here, um, you can sort of see it, in, you can see it here in our time curves, but it's really obvious when you look at the work loops that the um, peak EMG activation is right before uh, peak lengthening and peak force generation. Um, and again, we can take the area underneath the curve and you see that it's net positive work being done, indicating the triceps surrey are acting like a motor, like we expect in, in healthy controls. Now, in contrast, the children with CP are shown in red um, and are showing less excursion, um, an earlier force activation there, um, and less force generation overall. Um, and I'm going to start by showing you this, these three representative cases. So I mentioned we had a pretty heterogeneous group of children with CP that we tested. Um, kids walking in crouch, um, in crouch and Aquinas, and just Aquinas. 
But what hopefully stands out to you is they are all showing this very spring-like behavior um, and this also early activation of EMG. So it's most yellow uh, pretty much upon onset of uh, loading. Um, and the average was also the, uh, very similar. So pretty cool. We saw uh, heterogeneous children with CP have a homogeneous spring-like behavior in the triceps area, really not doing a lot of net work. Um, and again, we can look at that net work. Um, you see here the controls as you walk faster um, are doing more net work. Um, and quite obviously here, the children with CP, despite walking even a little bit faster than the controls at a slow speed, are still doing pretty much no net work. Um, it's significantly lower. Um, and this is true, you can see the standard deviation of the kids with CP. Um, they had different walking times, but still really not doing a lot of net work. So now we want to look uh, even closer at a subset of our children with CP. So we had seven children walking in crouch gait. So we looked further at them. And uh, you know, you see, you saw just now the triceps curves on the left. Um, I'll walk through the controls um, quadriceps work loops on the right, if you've never seen work loops before for quads. Um, but uh, what's kind of neat, but as we expect, uh, the quads are acting like a spring um, during loading response um, and, and mid stance. So um, during loading response, you're increasing your uh, excursion and force, and that energy is redirected past mid, mid stance and, um, and basically until um, opposite foot contact. There's really this kind of spring-like um, behavior of the quads in controls. Um, quite a different story for the children with CP, and in fact, almost the role reversal. Uh, so we see that the kids with CP are doing positive work. So they're uh, starting here at the, this asterisk and doing um, positive work, uh, which we can see when we look at the area underneath the curve as well. Um, so when we look at the bar charts of the network, um, again, tricep surrey in typical controls, um, they are acting like a motor in uh, the tricep surrey and then kind of a spring in their quads, at least in the, the uh, foot contact to opposite foot contact. And then this behavior is basically uh, reversed in children with CP. So kids with CP um, in crouch gait are uh, having a spring-like triceps and a motor-like quadriceps behavior. So this is really cool. Um, and what we saw is this work loops revealed this redistribution of positive work in children with CP walking in crouch. Um, we saw a bit of this in, in the earlier talks as well, but we suspect that this reduced push off work relates to higher metabolic costs. We know how efficient our triceps surrey are. And so we don't have that in the kids with CP. And so it, um, it could likely play a part. Um, and we're really excited because uh, we're taking this tensiometry uh, to the next step and, and putting it into the operating room. So we've been fortunate enough to work with Dr. Tom Novacek, who's an orthopedic surgeon at Gillette. Um, and we've placed this tensiometer on kids uh, during gastroc recession surgery. So that's a gastroc lengthening um, and getting pre and post uh, force data, which they've never been able to get before. Um, so now we've got this force length relationship that we can look at pre and post surgery, pre and post um, treatment, and so on. Um, so this is so cool. <laughs> um, so I'll end there. Thank you so much to the ASB for this nomination. We are really honored uh, on behalf of my, my co-authors. Uh, thank you to our fund, uh, funding and to our um, collaborators at Gillette. It's really been an interdisciplinary um, group that we've worked with, physical therapists, surgeons, uh, biomechanists, et cetera. So thank you so much for your time, and I'll take questions. Wonderful job, great presentation and really uh, exciting work using some novel technology. So super cool. Let's jump to questions here. So with the vibrations from the force measurement, do you find any issues with proprioception or is the frequency outside of that range that would affect proprioception? Thank you so much for the question. We have thought about that and we published a study, uh, I think in 2020 or 2019 by Samuel Acuna, uh, where we looked at uh, how the uh, tensiometer affects balance. And we found uh, very 
uh, no change, no significant change in, in balance. And we've also seen no significant change in, in gate metrics, uh, angles, moments, powers uh, with the tensiometer on or off. So yes, uh, uh, we, it's a very light vibration. We don't suspect any. Great, next question. So great talk, phenomenal clinical potential. How much of this motor behavior is complicated by inert joint stiffness in these children slash loss of motion in the affected joints? Yeah, so um, that was sort of uh, an interesting finding for us too, is that again, we, we tested this heterogeneous group of kids. So some kids had spasticity, some had already gone through a selective dorsal rhizotomy and didn't exhibit a lot of spasticity. Um, they had a range of uh, range of motion limitations as well. And, and we saw this kind of consistent response um, in terms of the spring-like uh, behavior of the tricep surrey too. So um, we're still digging into that a little bit more to see if there's any relationship, but that, that was really surprising to us um, that our heterogeneous group had such a homogeneous response. Wonderful. Well, with that, we're gonna end this session. Anna, please look at the chat and note that there are a couple questions that we didn't get to from, uh, let's see, from Brecca Gaffney and Brooke Slavens. Um, and, our, and Julia has posted the link to the spatial chat room where speaker, speakers will go and we can have some continued conversations in the room S1 Borelli. But lastly, I just wanna thank all of our award winners and our finalists today for these really intriguing presentations of some awesome biomechanics. So everyone, please enjoy the rest of the uh, day and, and, and presentations tomorrow and, and tune in to the ASB business meeting tomorrow to hear the winners of the journal awards. Thanks everybody.